I'd like to go ahead and call uh, the meeting of the Dental Board of California to order. Uh, good morning and welcome. This is our quarterly meeting on May 12, 2017. Please turn your cell phones to silent. Uh, you may notice board members accessing their laptops. These are used to access meeting materials only. This is an official meeting of the Dental Board of California, and we welcome public comment on any item on the agenda, and it is the board's intent to ask for comment prior to the board taking action on any agenda item. If for some reason I forget to ask for public comment and you wish to speak on that item, please raise your hand and you will be recognized. Depending on the number of people who would like to testify, a time limit may be imposed. We ask all speakers to please stay on topic. If the time limit is necessary, keep your comments to that time limit. With that, I would like to call the meeting to order, and I'll ask uh, Yvette to please call the roll. Okay, maybe. Okay. In her absence, Sarah. Dr. Witcher. Present. Dr. Stewart. Present. Ms. Burden. Dr. Chan. Here. Ms. Chappelle Ingram. Ms. Forsyth. Ms. King. Dr. Lai. Dr. Lay? Here. Ms. McKenzie? Here. Ms. Medina? Here. Dr. Morrow? Here. We have a quorum. Thank you, and I'd like to note for the record that Ms. Burton and Ms. Chappelle Ingram just joined the meeting. Thank you. Okay, uh, we're going to start off here with item number seven, executive officer's report. Karen sends her greetings to you all and regrets that she can't be here, but in her absence, her very capable AEO will give her report. So I'm going to share the information that Karen had provided in the executive officer's report that's in your meeting materials. Um, a quick staffing update. I'm pleased to announce that we actually just hired our enforcement chief and Mr. Carlos Alvarez, who has been our supervising investigator, one in the Sacramento office for the last couple of years, has graciously accepted the position. Carlos, can you please? So he is ready to hit the ground running, and we've got a lot of work ahead of us, so he's excited for the job. Um, the admin unit currently has one vacancy for the legislative and regulatory analyst. We are in the process of filling that vacancy. The licensing and examinations unit has two and a half vacancies, but we are also in the process of filling those. The dental assisting program has one vacancy. Enforcement uh, complaint and compliance unit has two vacancies. The investigative analysis unit has one vacancy and the Sacramento field office has one vacancy. The orange field office has one vacancy. Um, we recently learned that dental assisting council member Emma Ramos um, had to unfortunately resign from her faculty position on the council. So we will be doing the recruitment for that position. That information and uh, recruitment announcement will be posted on the board's website in the next few weeks. Board committee assignments, unfortunately with the loss of Dr. Wu and uh, Steve Afriot and Katie Dawson, we've had to make some um, committee reassignments. And then we've also gained a new board member, Ms. Abigail Medina. And so committee assignments have been uh, reassigned and are now available on the board's website. Um, I'd also like to announce that we've uh, had three board reappointments this year. Dr. Stewart, Dr. Lai, and Fran Burton have all been reappointed to the board. So congratulations on your reappointment. Um, and last but not least, we did receive a letter from the American Dental Association and the American Education uh, Association to, that was directed to Dr. Montez of OPES at DCA requesting that OPES consider the evaluation of the remaining two clinical examinations as a national exam. That letter is included in your board meeting materials. This is an informational only item. This item also includes the response from Dr. Montez indicating that we're on OPES is unable to conduct those evaluations at this time. Um, typically what happens as we've had with ADEX and REB is there's legislation that's um, initiated and passed which would dictate the need for OPS to do a validation study and then we would implement the examination after statute. So that concludes my report for today and I'd be happy to answer any questions. Um, I did want to point out that unfortunately um, the report for from the DHCC 
was inadvertently left off of the agenda, so I want to apologize for that. They did have a meeting uh, at the beginning of May, and Mr. Anthony Lum is here, their interim executive officer. Um, and while I know I realize it's not on the agenda, I'd like to invite him up as part of public comment to just um, provide comment to us on what occurred. Thank you, sir. Good morning. I want to thank the board for the opportunity to report the dental hygiene activities since, the, since your last meeting. And my apologies that my president, Noel Kelsch, couldn't be here, um, so I'm here to provide the update. Our first and major project for the year is uh, Sunset Review. We are up for that for this year, and currently um, I have, I'm having my staff put together the information and data that's necessary for the report. Um, until, until we receive the questions from the legislature. Hopefully, you know, we'll have everything in place as far as the standard uh, information, and then uh, we can address any curveballs that the legislature has questions on. For staffing, uh, we currently have one vacancy, and that's our probation monitor uh, position. And uh, with our probation cases increasing, I'm looking to fill that position uh, pretty soon. Uh, we just need to finalize the duty statement and then we'll be active in uh, advertising the position. Currently we're over, uh, overseeing our uh, dental hygiene educational programs and that's an ongoing process to ensure that they comply with the law. Now that we have the resources, we're putting an emphasis on reviewing the programs for the, in the interest of consumer protection for the students, for the faculty that work there, and the patients that they see. Also in working with the programs, I've been in contact with many of the program directors to enhance communication between us and them. So that way if there's any uh, issues that arise that they have questions upon, we can hopefully get them resolved quickly. I also participated in multiple outreach events um, with dental hygiene students and one event with actually high school students that are looking to get into the healthcare profession. I wanted to bring the high school one to your attention because uh, it's with the sponsor of it was the Health Occupation Student Association and I've never heard of this association until six months ago when they invited us to their event and these kids were very bright they're all looking I would say a majority of them are looking to be doctors and dentists so with the number of questions that I received I just want to put it out there that um, it may be an outreach event that you attend in the future um, the, these kids were very bright and had a ton of questions and the ones that I could, I referred to the dental board for reference. Also, um, last week uh, I participated and we had a booth at the CDHA uh, Spring Scientific Session, uh, which was going on at the same time as the CDA convention. And uh, that, was, that was a fun event to reach out to uh, dental hygiene students as well. We also conducted our, as Sarah mentioned, our dental hygiene committee uh, meetings over this past weekend and I want to thank Dr. Witcher for participating and attending our meeting and giving us the dental board update. Hopefully with the incident that occurred, everything's smooth. <laughs> we had a little bug issue, but uh, that was resolved. <laughs> a lot of good work was done uh, at the meeting, and uh, it included some of this, uh, some of the following uh, that I'm going to read. Um, we had several regulations that were approved uh, to be amended, either to clarify or add some language um, to allow us to perform uh, certain functions that we didn't have before. We received a lot of questions in regards to some of the requirements within the educational realm, and uh, some, of the, some of the language in there is maybe difficult to read, so we clarified a lot of that by, by presenting the materials in a different fashion, in, in chart form. So I think um, with the educational programs um, buy off on that, I think it'll be a good thing. We also wa we're also watching um, many of the same bills that you are uh, because evidently they, they affect the dental profession as a whole. So we're monitoring those as well. We also had a couple presentations from ADEX and REB in respect to their uh, exams and their scoring methodologies. Unfortunately, they didn't bring the materials that I requested in regards to comparing directly with California, and they just kind of went over all their national numbers, so I have to follow up with them to see if I can obtain California-specific uh, comparisons. We've also completed a new newsletter, and uh, 
a strategic plan brochure, and my full intention was to bring copies for you all, but they're on my counter at home in rushing for my flight. So what I'm going to do is I'll bring them down to Sarah so that way they can be forwarded to you for review. And lastly, uh, I want to thank you all again uh, because, you know, the continued cooperation and collaboration that we've had with, with the dental board has been phenomenal these past few years. Uh, working with Karen, Sarah, and now Carlos uh, has been wonderful, and I look forward to future projects with you all. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I'd just like uh, to note for the record that <clears throat> Judy Forsyth has joined the meeting. And also, during uh, yesterday's introduction of guests, I neglected to mention Dr. Norm Magnuson is here from REB. So, thanks for coming. Appreciate it. Dr. Mitcher? <clears throat> With your permission, could we back up for a second to the letter from the American Dental Association and IDEA regarding the, Absolutely. Uh, examinations? I think, you know, in fact and in reality, the Dental Board of California accepts the results of all licensing examinations already through our licensure by credential. Whatever examination, whatever examination was uh, taken to receive a license in whatever state, when they apply for a license through credential, we are accepting that examination. So in practicality, we already do accept the results through our licensure by credentialing. I, I have a comment about that, though. But licensure by credential does require five years of experience. Yeah, but yeah. it's still accepted. So, so I think what they're talking about isn't that. What I they're talking they about is it's like you're the for yeah. the newly licensed dentist. I realize which is that. They're, 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 they're not identifying that they're referring to initial licensure. They're just saying licensure. And we do that. Mm -hmm. we, we could, and I'm not making this as, an, as a recommendation, right. but we could discuss changing that five years to a different length of time. As some, some states, licensure by credential is immediately, some is one year, ours is five years. That's something we could look at. But we do, in fact, accept the results of all examinations through the credentialing process. So if I could make one comment. Um, it's really interesting that the ADA psychometricians have done evaluation and um, psychometric evaluation of the original exams. I would be very curious if ADA and IDEA would be um, interested in doing a psychometric evaluation of our portfolio because portfolio should be considered as also a <coughs> clinical exam. And I think short of that, I, I think it's really unfair. So um, for those from ADA I would, and IDEA, I would really be very interested in knowing whether or not the task force um, has any plan to do psychometric evaluation of our portfolio. Thank you. Uh, is there any public comment on the executive officer's report? Okay. Seeing none, we'll move on to the next item, budget report. In the meeting materials, you will find the budget report through the end of March of 2017. Um, the board has spent approximately 66% of its total uh, fund appropriation for fiscal year 2016-17. The meeting materials include copies of the budget report expenditure projections and the fund condition. Uh, you will see that we are looking at a fund deficit starting in 1819, so we will need to have a fee increase, uh, which the regulatory package that is going through the final rulemaking process should assist with. Um, the dental assisting fund condition is also include, included in your board meeting packet. We've spent approximately 64% of that total appropriation for fiscal year 2016-17 as well. I'd be happy to answer any questions relating to the expenditure projections or the fund conditions. Both funds are looking at a, a deficit in 1819, and like I said, those fee increases are going to be um, taking care of that deficit and that, the fiscal imbalance. There was um, a, a third issue brought up on this agenda that I wanted to bring to the board for consideration. Um, 
During Sunset Review in 2015, one of the issues that was brought up in the background report that was drafted by committee staff was the consideration of combining <coughs> the state dentistry fund and the state dental assistance <coughs> fund into one fund. And so we've researched the feasibility of doing that and we've consulted with the budget office um, with DCA and DCA ha has actually gone through this with a couple of other boards uh, recently, most, uh, most recently the optometry board um, and then combining their RDO um, funds with their optometry funds. Um, budget office believes that it's the most efficient uh, way of being fiscally responsible to have the combined funds so that one fund isn't um, essentially funding another fund. So an issue that we're having with the dental assisting fund is that it, it doesn't necessarily cover all of the overhead costs. All of the expenditures on the dental assisting fund does not cover all of the overhead costs for uh, the staff or you know the IT costs or the administrative costs. Those are usually borne by the state dentistry fund. Um, it becomes complicated and cumbersome to bill back on another dentistry fund. So for that reason, the budget office is, uh, is recommending that we consider combining the funds. So what I was hoping to ask the board for today was support in merging the two, the two funds into one. The process would begin as part of our sunset review, which won't begin until next year, but we're trying to be efficient with our, our time and make sure that we're checking things off of our item list here as we're moving along. So essentially next year, we would get the report from the Business and Professions Committee uh, to, to start putting together. And as part of that report, we have the option of asking basically our wish list. And so uh, we have the potential to include this on the wish list uh, to merge the two funds. It would take statutory change to merge the two funds. So this would be a, a couple year process at least, but budgets would be willing to work with us through that process and it could be relatively clean. So just presenting that to the board today. Uh, maybe we could have a motion to move this item in a second and then we can open it for discussion. I'll move it. I'll second. So, Chan, Forsyth, second. Can you move your mic a little closer, please? I'm sorry, yeah. I think the volume is, well, okay, okay. if I get really close. Uh, uh, you had a question? Um, just a point of inquiry, um, Sarah. If the funds are merged, would there still be a line item identifying the dental assisting expenses? So we have the option, as I understand it from the budget office, on our expenditure report to essentially create new line items and, and build it the way that we want it to be built. So we could essentially recreate that. Now, at the same time that all of this is going on, we are actually transitioning to from CalSTRS, uh, which is one reporting system, to Fiscal, which is going to be a new reporting system. And so there's different line item in, in coding, I know. I mean, new systems left and right. It's wonderful. Um, and so it's my understanding from budget office that we will be able to build it the way that we want to build it. And we should be able to generate reports to provide additional information. So as a corollary to that then, even though it's identified as a line item, um, in the actual reporting to the board in terms of the budget, will there be a separate like footnote that'll tell us what's, what portion is being spent on? I would have to, to check on that, but I believe that that should not be a problem to, to be calculated. Essentially, when you're talking about personnel expenses, we should be able to do a, a, a sub, sub breakout of what it is for the dentistry licensing portion. You know, it, it, to that effect, you could also break out enforcement as well, so. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Lyon. Uh, one question is, is the RDA practical exam, does that come through the budget of the R dental board or, or the RDA? That comes through the de state dental, dental assistant fund. Okay. Um, so essentially how the funds are completed is all of the fees that we generate through all of the applications are what sustain the revenue portion of the funds. All of the expenses are divided out be between the two funds. So all of the dental assisting examinations, so the RDA EF, the RDA practical, even the written examinations or contracts with OPS, that all comes out of the state dental assisting fund. So if they're combined, um, there should be a cost savings with not having the practical? 
there, there's already a cost savings without having the practical right now. Okay, thank you. Any other board? Oh, yes, Ms. Bird. And so your thought is to ask that this go in the omnibus bill ahead of our sunset report? No, what I'm requesting today is that the board support the, the thought of merging the two funds so that when we draft the report next year for sunset review in response to the committee's questions, that we add this to the wish list item so that the merging of the two funds could be considered as part of our sunset review bill. Okay. Uh, at this time, I'd like, oh. I'd like to move it then. Do we need a motion? Uh, public comment. It's happened. been moved and seconded, I'm sorry. And we're, I'd, I'd like to now open this to public comment. Either, uh, either the budget report or the action item to move the two dental assisting, mer merge the dental assisting and state dentistry fund. Yes, please come forward. <clears throat> um, Shelley Sorensen from Reedley College. Um, I just want to say I am in favor of making sure that the line items, I agree with you, that they should be kept separate so that we know what's being spent um, on the dental assisting side as well as dental, dental board, so. I don't think there's any intent to do anything yeah. differently. Yeah, um, it, it, yeah, it sounds that way. I just want to say I'm in support of that comment. Good, so, thank, you. thank you. Okay, if there's no further discussion, if you could call the roll, please. Okay. Um, Dr. Richard? Yes. Dr. Stewart? Yes. Fran Burton? Yes. <clears throat> Dr. Chan? Yes. Yvette? Yes. Judith Forsythe? Yes. Kathleen? Dr. Lai? Yes. Dr. Lay? Yes. Uh, Meredith McKenzie? Yes. Abigail Medina? Yes. Steve Morrill? Dr. Yes. Morrill. Okay, Mr. President, we have a Passes. Okay, thank you. Uh, moving ahead, uh, agenda item number nine, re discussion and possible action regarding amendments to the board's proposed rulemaking to amend CCR Title 16 relevant to fee increase. Uh, this was mentioned yesterday during the Ledge Committee report, uh, and I believe, Sarah, we'll take this item. Thank you. So the board has promulgated the regulation to increase the fees for both dentistry and dental assisting, and we've been working on the final rulemaking process. The rulemaking was approved by the Department of Consumer Affairs and also by the state agency that oversees our department and was submitted to the Office of Administrative Law at the beginning of April, specifically April 13th of 2017. And so the review of the, the Department of Finance review and the OAL review were going to be done concurrently in order for us to make a timeline to make sure that we had our fee increase effective by J July 1st of 2017. So after we submitted the fee increase regulatory package, I received a phone call from a staff attorney over at the Office of Administrative Law with a couple of questions uh, relating to the fee increase rulemaking file and some questions regarding some inconsistencies in the language that was proposed from the proposed language to the modified text. So as a result, I've ha asked Jerry, I think she just passed out a memo to you. We will need, uh, I'm requesting the board to take action to modify the text as recommended by staff today. And so I am prepared to walk you through these amendments. Essentially, if you turn to page two of, of the, proposed language, there's language in here that's highlighted in gray. The oral conscious sedation certificate renewal, the modified text indicated that the fee was 136. The action taken by the board at the August 2016 meeting actually was that the fee should be 168. So this is a correction to that um, in inaccuracy in the original modified text. When you drop down to the next highlighted section, AB license certification for $50, this was language that was originally included on the proposed language. There was no comment received on this language, but was erroneously dropped off in the modified text. So just for clarification purposes, we're adding it back in into the second modified text. And as a result of adding AB license certification back in, we've had to modify 
the numbering or the lettering on the subdivisions for AC and AD for the application for law and ethics and the adult or minor oral conscious sedation certificate. So those are, they're all technical amendments. Today I'm asking the board to modify the text as recommended and direct staff to take all steps necessary to complete the rulemaking process, including preparing the second modified text for a 15 day public comment period, which includes the amendments accepted by the board at this meeting. If after the second 15 day public comment period, no adverse comments are received, authorize the executive officer to make any non-substantive changes to the proposed regulations before completing the rulemaking process and adopt the proposed amendments to California Code of Regulations, Title 16, Section 1021 and 1022, relevant to the dentistry and dental assisting fee increase as noticed in the second modified text. I believe that with this modification, I don't anticipate that we would have public comment in response to this. We'll have to see. We're prepared to modify the text and post it on Monday for 15 day public comment. We should have the modifications to OAL within the review time frame and still be on target to have the fee increase effective this year. Right now, working with the DCA Breeze team, the fee increase most likely will not become effective until the October 1st of 2017 date. Um, that will allow Breeze the, the time to make the modifications to the renewal notices that would be sent out for the October renewal cycle. And, and we would be able to generate that revenue. Um, I've already checked with the budget office and our fund can sustain waiting until October 1st to collect that revenue. Okay. <clears throat> Move, Bert. Sorry, I have a second. Have a quick, uh, Morrow second. Moved by Burton, seconded by Morrow. I have a question. Yes. <clears throat> item number, uh, item, not number, <laughs> item T. On page two, general anesthesia, conscious sedation, on-site inspection and evaluation fee. Do I need to get my prescription changed or did that actually go from $250 to $2,000? That is just the on-site inspection for GA and CS well, I permit understand orders. that, but yes. that's a, that is more than a significant increase. What's the justification for going from $250 to $2,000? Well, uh, a couple of things. In the fee analysis that was done by our consultant, the cost of the on-site inspection, which only has to be done every six years right. for your permit, was about $4,300. Okay. And so $2,000, it is a big jump, but it's less than it might have okay. been. Uh, this was uh, presented at prior meetings. Public uh, input was received. Okay. and uh, some reluctant and kind of grudging acknowledgement that we would have to support the sure. program. So I just wanted to check and make sure that there is adequate, uh, adequate data to support that increase. It was supported by the study. Okay, thank you. In fact, it should have been more, but you know, Got it. Chan. And Just so that we can hear it, when you see the dental auxiliary uh, fees for the, some of the increases are significant also, so. Could you, could you speak into oh, the mic a little bit? So for the dental auxiliary, um, fee increases, there are significant jumps there too, proportionately. So I think we just need to hear the justification for that too. Well, it was similar. And uh, again, uh, I was on the subcommittee uh, that looked at this. And, and Sarah, please jump in if there's anything so, uh, to add. So with, with the rulemaking process, like, like I mentioned, this rulemaking has actually already been approved by the board and has already gone through the final rulemaking process. So at this point in time, it's already been vetted via a fee audit that was conducted uh, during our sunset review. There was a subcommittee that looked at the fees to try to make an assessment. It was discussed at the board over a course of, I believe, three or four meetings with different proposals. And these were the fees that were decided upon by the board. And so this is what we've been moving forward with, and this is what we're generating um, our projected revenue based on. And this, there, is, there is justification to support all of these expenditures, all of these fees. Um, according to the fee increase, a lot of the increases should have been significantly more. And the subcommittee's job was to distribute this around in a way that caused the least pain. And we were very sensitive to the fact that it's a lot of money for dental assistants to pay the application fee, and we did what we could. And you know, we didn't really receive adverse comment from that group, so uh, that was why it was approved. Thank you. So, move in a second. Is there public comment on this item? Seeing none, uh, would you go ahead and call the roll, please? Sure, well, um, Dr. Witcher. Yes. 
Dr. Stewart? Yes. Fran Burden? Yes. Dr. Chan? Yes. Bet yes. <clears throat> Judith Forsythe? Yes. <clears throat> Dr. Lai? Yes. Dr. Lay? Yes. Meredith McKenzie? Yes. Abigail McDina? Yes. Dr. Morrow? Yes. Mr. President, it passes. Okay, thank you. Uh, next, we'll move forward with um, review of dental licensure and permit statistics. I believe this is just an informational item. Yes, this, this is informational only. Board staff has provided a breakdown of the current licensing populations. We also provided a breakdown um, based on the pathway to licensure for the dentistry license categories as well as the permits. It also provides uh, a breakdown of the active licensees by county um, in relation to the total population. And um, the, it also provides information relating to the number of applications we've received, how many have been approved, how many have been denied, how many have been withdrawn since the beginning of 2017. Any board member discussion? Any public comment? As I said, this is an informational item only. Next, uh, we'll move to the licensure certification and permit uh, committee report on closed session. Dr. Lai. Thank you. Good morning. So uh, yesterday we, the um, LCP met to consider six applications for issuance of a new license to replace a canceled one. The details of the applications were included to all board members and the committee recommends these recommendations of this group. The first request for dentist JF for issuance of a new license to replace cancel. Um, the board approved issuance of a new license to replace a cancel license with condition that applicant successfully passes California law and ethics. And this is the uh, staff recommendation. Uh, we reviewed, it went very efficiently and we reviewed everybody uh, very quickly and uh, everybody did their homework. So that was, that was the first one. So. Uh, the second request is for dentist EI uh, for issuance of a new license to replace a canceled one. The, uh, this one was uh, a little interesting. Uh, the board approves the issuance of a new license to replace the canceled one in the condition that the applicant successfully passes REB and the notarization of, and the completion of her application. So she didn't have her uh, application notarized because she actually lived out of state for uh, uh, approximately 15 years and is moving back to California. And we considered uh, that one to be uh, in need of, of taking the rep over again. Okay. The third request is for dentist SM uh, for issuance of a new license to replace a canceled one. Uh, you know, let me go, let go back and, and um, with dentist EI. Um, the very fact that she didn't keep her license valid in California, uh, she could have kept her CEs up and paid her fees, and she obviously decided um, many, many years later to come back and, and try to do this. But to protect the public, we, we thought that She's been out of the, the, the game so long that that, that was uh, very important for us to uh, have her re-examined. Okay, okay uh, dentist three, sorry. Uh, that was dentist SM. And uh, to replace the cancel license, uh, the committee con in closed session recommends the committee to approve the issuance of a new license by passing successfully the California Law and Ethics. Fourth dentist, dentist BR. Again, uh, same issue. Uh, she let her li license lapse, so the board approves issuance of a new license to replace the canceled license with the condition of application successfully passes California law and ethics. And also, uh, he also was a, a out of state uh, person, and uh, we need the completion of the notarization. The fifth request was RDA HM for the issuance of a new license to replace a canceled one. Uh, the committee in closed session recommended uh, by uh, the board's recommendation to 
uh, the staff's recommendation to successfully pass the law on ethics uh, without written, uh, since she's she has been actively in 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 the field. So uh, just a law on ethics for her. The sixth request was dentist dental assistant CP uh, issuance of a new license to replace a canceled license was considered. Um, board approved issuance of a new license to replace a canceled license with the condition that, again, uh, just su successfully passing just the law and ethics. So no re-examination uh, necessary. Uh, so um, that's our report. Could I have a motion to accept the LCP report? So moved. Second. So uh, Morrow, second by Chan. Any board member discussion? I, I just had one question on EI, and the, you know, the way I understand it is that uh, that licensee didn't practice very long and had been away from the practice of dentistry entirely for approximately 15 years. That's and my understanding. Yeah, okay, thank you. Very good. Uh, would you go ahead and call the roll then, please? Oh, yes. uh, is there any public comment on this item? I know it's a closed session item, but still. Okay, seeing none, go ahead. Okay, Dr. Richard? Yes. Dr. Stewart? Yes. Brand Burden? Yes. Dr. Chan? Yes. Yvette, yes. Judith Forsythe? Yes. Dr. Lai? Yes. Dr. Lay? Yes. Meredith McKenzie? Yes. Abigail Medina? Yes. Dr. Morrow? Yes. Mr. President, it passes. Thank you. Okay, moving ahead, item number 12, review enforcement statistics and trends. I believe Carlos was going to handle that. <coughs> Once again, congratulations on taking the position as enforcement chief. Good morning, and uh, good morning, board members. Uh, I just want to thank all the board members for your support and confidence that you had in me. So I really appreciate that. Also want to thank Karen, who's not here, and Sarah for, also for their support that they've given me during this transition. And I really appreciate that. And also the uh, Orange office, Sacramento office, uh, they really uh, stood behind me and uh, had confidence in me to uh, do this role, being an enforcement chief. So I want to thank uh, everybody. And again, just my goal is to continue the success that the uh, Dunham Board uh, has and for, to, for the enforcement program to be successful as we continue on. So I want to thank everybody. So, um, so now on the agenda number 12, enforcement statistics and trends. Uh, the following are the enforcement division statistics for the third quarter, January 1st, 2017 to March 31st, 2017 of the fiscal year, 2016-2017. Uh, the trends over the last three fiscal years and the last three quarters are included, and we have charts for you for references, uh, one through three. And I'll start off with complaints and compliance, and we have a chart uh, located on page five if you want to follow through, and that's what I'm gonna be uh, going over to locate on chart two. And that's, uh, like, again, that's on page five. So for uh, complaints and compliance, uh, the total number of complaints received during the third quarter was 803, mm -hmm. uh, averaging 268 complaints per month. Uh, complaint cases open, currently what we have is 1,182 cases. The uh, average caseload per Consumer service analyst during the third quarter was 238 complaints. And we have that broken down, and also that's located on page two, just right behind. Uh, we have a graph for you to follow. So for 30, uh, zero to three months, for quarter three, we had 14, uh, I'm sorry, 415 cases. Uh, three to six months, we have 299 cases. Six to nine months, we have 246 cases, and nine to 12 months, we have 149. And one year plus, we have 73 cases, which equals out to uh, 1,182 cases. Does anybody have any questions about the cases? Yes. Well, thank you, Carlos, for, 
for um, graphically displaying a lot of the, uh, the data that you have. And the purpose of the trend analysis is to look for trends. So the first purpose that I thought that would be of value is for budgeting. Um, the second purpose is to maybe identify um, items that you see might be worthwhile to put educational intervention out there because you're seeing trends in that. Yeah. But when we compare the fiscal year 15-16 to what we see currently, it's almost like four to five times as many uh, cases that you're um, investigating. Any trends that you see there? There, there, there is a lot of trends, and and like you said, because it comes through uh, education, and we're getting in. And as we go on, you're going to see that most of the trends that we came in for the last quarter were incompetence and negligence, and those are new trends. But uh, the way we do it to correct that is with public reprimands or probation, where we add, uh, where we add. Uh, I'm sorry education we have that and so we see it we make a correction and that's the way we also do it is to uh, add education and, and educate the, the dentist or the DDS so we could reduce these numbers all these complaints are coming in so that's our that's how we do it is our goal is to educate them So uh, complaint uh, cases closed. So the total number of complaint cases closed during the quarter three was 534, averaging 170 per month. So for quarter three, a complaint took an average of 145 days to close. And so chart one displays the average complaint closure age over the previous three fiscal years through current quarter. And currently investigations, currently we have 853 cases at the end of the quarter three, there were approximately 853 open investigative cases and 46 open inspection cases. For this quarter, the average caseload was 42 per investigator, 45 per special investigator, and 28 for an enforcement analyst. A question, Carlos? Yes. Of those um, cases that were closed, how many were closed without merit? Is that is that something that it re is reflected here? Uh, there is. It is reflected there, and um, I'll get into it's uh, actually as I go through the chart. It is reflected there, where it's closed uh, without merit. So I would say it's less than uh, half what I'm actually producing here. But we do get cases where the analyst sends off or the investigator sent off, we get dental consultant, we get it closed without merit because there's no errors. And also once we, uh, the investigator does a whole complete investigation, we send it off to the, to the expert, that comes back with no errors as well. Yeah, but it is noted here, I'm sorry. But. So uh, comparing the third quarter to the last uh, number of cases, age one to two years has decreased by 6% from 400 to 346, and the number of cases aged over three years has decreased by 1% from 55 to 45. And by decreasing this, I've been constantly with working with the managers, with the investigators, because that's been our priority, is to work on this uh, case aging, and we've been working very hard with the three years to reduce that, and we've been making that a priority. So the investigations case closed, the total number of investigations case closed filed with the Office of the Attorney General or filed with the District Attorney's uh, Office during the third quarter is 260. And that was an average of 87 per month. The average number of days an investigation took to complete the investigation during the third quarter was 426 days. And that's located on page four in chart one. One other question. Um, and I don't know whether this is a good time to ask that. I'm looking back at page two at the average number of cases for investigator, special investigator, and enforcement analyst. Yes. How, 
how many of those do you have any statistics on probation monitoring yes we do we do so this is not including probation monitoring so all these these 42 per investigator 45 per investigator and 24 analysis that's not including probation monitoring that's this is just in, just active cases complaints that we receive okay and both investigator and special investigator are monitors right correct and we also have our inspectors who also monitor but they're responsible for all the tollings for all the tollers out of state that the that's what they're responsible for. Okay. Yeah. Could I, could I make, I'll make a comment also. Thanks for bringing that up. Again, just to underscore, I think we've talked about this a couple of times before, but the average case load per investigator is about double of most of the other boards and bureaus that do this. And I know there's been discussion about having a separate probation unit to handle the probation load. I know that's a wish list item. It's out Correct. there. The other thing I understand is, uh, and we, we talk about collection of fees, uh, you know, getting the cost of it, re recouping the cost of investigation. And um, we see that a lot of those folks are on payment plans and things. And I understand that also falls on the probation officer handling that, the collection of those fees. Yes, that is correct. Uh, yeah. The probation monitor is responsible for that, for collecting the fees. And so then if we're getting, uh, they're not being cooperative, uh, receiving the fees, then that's something we can move forward as a probation violation. Yeah, I, I wonder if it would be, you know, in our office when we do collections, we've had our office staff do that, and it really has been terribly inefficient. We've sent that out for an outside agency to handle. I wonder if maybe we could decrease some of the work burden on our investigative staff, keep them doing investigations and not maybe being collection, right. a collection service? It's just a thought. Just no, that, that is the hope by having a probation unit and to take that away from the investigators so they can focus on investigations, probation uh, monitoring, they can focus on the probationers. And so, but that's our goal is to have a probation unit. Could we see some statistics next meeting? on monitoring and how many cases are being monitored currently yeah, like some totals yeah and we're, we're going to cover probation monitoring because we also have probation monitoring our, on our performance measures so i'll be covering that so for administrative and disciplinary action and that's all located as well on chart two on the very next page. So uh, a total of 18 citations were issued during the third quarter, and that's an increase from the total of four that were issued in the second quarter. A total of 32 accusations were filed during the third quarter. That's an increase from the total of 25 that were filed during the second quarter. A total of 46 cases were referred to the Attorney General's office with a total of 126 cases pending at the end of the third quarter and there were approximately 271 open probation cases at the end of the third quarter. The three month average for a disciplinary case to be completed was 1,643 days. And now as you well, we've been working with uh, Linda Schneider to reduce this number. Uh, I guess uh, Linda Schneider presented that they're hiring more staff, so we're gonna work with the Attorney General's office to reduce this number here. And so below we have the, the chart one, which displays the average case uh, closure age over the last three fiscal years through the current quarter for complaint investigation and disciplinary actions. So does anybody have any questions on these charts here, chart two? I, I just have one. You know, at, at the last meeting you pointed out that uh, your unit had lost a number of staff members and had to recruit and replace, and there had been sort of a buildup of caseload because of that. And I think that may be reflected in the up tr uptrend we see uh, toward the uh, toward Q3 here. And so, you know, I think we can look forward to that improving yeah. as now you're fully to, staffed. Yeah, to reducing that because we only have one open uh, vacancy in the uh, orange office. But like I said, we've been making it a priority to uh, to work. And so we've been, unfortunately, we have to give investigators more cases, case load, because like I said, we want to uh, improve these numbers. So we've been making everything our priority, but again, just because we're short staff, it's not, that's not an excuse. 
So, but we have been making all cases priorities and constantly uh, communications with Patrick Morsey, uh, Russ Predmore, and we've been working on these numbers. So if you go to page six and seven, we have uh, complaint allegations. So uh, charts three and three B coincide with each other. Then as uh, you can see, the majority of the allegations that came in for the quarter, 65% were uh, incompetence and negligence. And uh, that's why I was stating uh, that we try to reduce this by, again, with public recommends or with uh, probation where we offer education, and that's how we correct uh, this problem and reduce uh, the complaints that are coming in in competence and negligence is by through education and monitoring. Tom, has anybody questions on charts three and three B? Yes. Carlos, one of the things that I've been seeing in my office is I've had some patients come in for, for second opinions, and uh, they've been told by another dentist that they had 10, 12 cavities, and, and, uh, and, and I was able to tell them that they didn't have one. So where would that fit in your, um, that, I don't see that as incompetence or negligence. What, uh, where, where would that scenario fit in terms of your examination and your placement of, those, of that concern? For that field, it will still go into incompetence and negligence to go into that field. But if they're doing the sex of billing by this treatment, that also will fall into fraud. So we'll separate those two uh, complaints. Because if they're doing that, they're saying, no, they don't have any cavities and the debt is billed for that, then now we're looking into fraud for that. So we kind of, it splits off and we still consider that negligence, incompetence with fraud. Thank you. But again, we make that determination through the dental consultant and dental expert. Dr. Chan. Carlos, kind of help me. Um, when we do public approval, um, it's an individual case. Do we still do the newsletter where we send it out to the licensees, those types of cases, as sort of a warning to the general licensed population? Well, if I mean, how do we teach the whole yeah. population? Well, as far as, like I said, those public recommends or anything, that would go on our website uh -huh. uh, to view, but we don't, uh, and we do have a hot sheet uh, on our website where it says this DDS was sent for a public recommend, this DDS cases were sent to the Attorney General's office, or it's, there's a certain date where it's becoming effective where they're going on probation. So we do have this information on the website, which is public. And again, uh, but as far as uh, us sending out newsletters saying, you know, this is currently going on with this DDS, uh, we don't do that. But like I said, we do have hot sheets <laughs> and everything is public on our website. So if a patient goes on there and logs on, they're gonna be able to see that, yes, uh, we worked on that case. What but I we meant, don't send out newsletters per yeah. se. What I meant was, was not individuals, but do it as a aggregate experience that we're seeing these things happening that are coming before the board. Does that change the way that we educate our licensees? Well, there's only, if it's sorry, you can help me, there's only so much that we can do by making this public. But, um, you know, like I said, we do it, do it by hot sheets every month. We update our website with hot sheets. Mm -hmm. So the hot sheets is essentially a, a big summary of all of the disciplinary actions that have been taken during that period of time. Mm -hmm. And it is available on the board's website. Uh, we're, I know in the past that we have gone out to schools to share educational experiences and report out to the students to you know, share what we typically see in complaints and things to be aware of and uh, violations of the Dental Practice Act to be aware of. Um, but, you know, education and outreach is on our list to do, but it, again, it takes resources that we don't necessarily have right now. Uh, yeah, the, the newsletter is something that's on our wish list. Uh, would you like to be editor of the newsletter? Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So uh, that, uh, agenda number 13 is review of fiscal year 2016-27 second quarter performance measures. Carlos, 
Oh, yes. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry. So uh, I guess there's no there's no board member comments on this item. Are there any public comments on the enforcement report? Dr. K. Hi. <clears throat> I really didn't come here for this particular could you, issue. Could you identify it, yourself? For the Alan K., uh, president of uh, California Association of Oral Surgeons and past board president and member. Uh, I had no intention of coming up here, but after hearing that, when I was on the board many, many years ago, that was about when I think we put out probably the last newsletter that ever got printed. And um, from my experience, I can tell you that being on the internet is all well and good, but there was a, an attitude of when that newsletter went out in an envelope that said the Dental Board of California, it got opened, and most practitioners couldn't wait to read and see what was going on. And I always felt that it was a tremendous deterrent, uh, and unfortunately it disappeared. Also, you can expect a major uptick of cases coming in because of the explosion and implants that are going on right now. And there's also a big drive by commercial exhibitors and manufacturers to control what they consider, they consider, standard of care, not what the professionals who teach consider the standard of care. And that's something that I think you need to take it, uh, another look at because it's kind of the tail wagging the dog. Just a few comments. Thank you. Okay, if there's no additional comment, uh, Carlos, could you please continue with the uh, review of uh, second quarter performance measures from the department? Yes, uh, performance measures are linked to directly to the agency's mission, vision, and strategic objectives and initiatives. And the data is collected quarterly and reported to the department's uh, website, DCA website. So the enforcement performance measures uh, for quarter two will be covering from October to December 2016. So we have uh, volume, PM1 is volume. So we have number of complaints and convictions received. So for uh, that, uh, for October, we received 273. November was 283 and 238 for December. So total received was 794. Uh, number of complaints and convictions. Monthly average was 265, and the majority were complaints of 748 with 46 convictions. Moving to the next page, we have the intake volume. So the number of complaints closed or assigned to an investigator. Uh, in October was 266, November was 288, and December was 248, so a total of uh, 802, monthly average was 267. And we had intake cycle times, the average number of days from the complaint receipt to the date the complaint was closed or assigned to an investigator. And we have a target date of 10 days and we actually been below that target date and we've been doing that in four days. We have investigation uh, volume, number of investigations closed, not including cases transmitted to the Attorney General's office. For October, we had 287, November we had 228, and December we had 273. So a total was 788 uh, cases, and monthly average was 263. So investigation cycle times, this is the average number of days to complete the entire enforcement process for cases not transmitted to the Attorney General's office. And the average target date is 270 days, and we've been below the target dates, and we've been uh, Accomplish this actual days of 191 days. Formal discipline. Cases closed after transmission to the Attorney General's office for formal disciplinary action. This includes formal discipline, closures without formal discipline, withdrawals or, di or dismissals. Uh, October we had two, November we had 16, and December we had 10. And that was a total of 28, and the monthly average was nine. And for formal discipline, again, this is one that we've been working with the Attorney General's office. Uh, the average number of days to close cases after transmission to the Attorney General for formal disciplinary action. This includes formal discipline and closures without formal discipline. And so that target date, we've been over the target date, that's 1,170 days. But again, this is something that we've been working with the Attorney General's office to reduce this number. And now we get into probation intake, uh, number of new probation cases. 
was uh, for October was three, November we see seven, and December we see six for a total of 16. And the provision intake cycle time, this is the average days that from the monitor assignment to the date the monitor makes the first contact with the probationer and our goal is to make contact with the probationer before the effective date when they go on to probation. And we have a target date of 10 days and we've been below that uh, averaging seven days. So we, uh, we make it a priority to get in contact with the probation uh, before their effective date goes off to review what their uh, conditions are. And that completes my report. If anybody has any questions. Any board member questions? Public comment on the uh, department statistics. Okay, seeing none, we'll move uh, forward to the next item. Uh, update on proposed changes to minimum standards for infection control. The board is responsible for reviewing the minimum standards for infection control on an annual basis. The last time the regulations were uh, amended was in 2011, and while the board has maintained compliance with the annual review, no uh, modifications have been warranted until now. A subcommittee of Dr. Lay and Ms. Noel Kelsch met in February, it was right before the February board meeting, to discuss some of the updates that came out in the CDC's summary of infection and prevention practices in dental settings that was released in October of 2016. One of the main topics of that discussion and uh, potential amendments that were going to be brought forward to the board were in relation to the water um, infection requirements. Um, however, since that meeting, AB 1277 was introduced and requires the board uh, and con consistent with and in addition to the Federal Centers for Disease Control and Prevention uh, has additional recommendations for procedural water, water quality. So rather than duplicate work and promulgate a regulation that we may need to change as a result of legislation that may pass at the end of this year, uh, board staff is holding off on the promulgation of the regulation and we hope to be able to bring the regulation to the board for review at the November board meeting at this time. And I would like just to make a comment. The current minimum standards are still um, in effect and that we are still in compliance. Um, and I think it will still protect the public. Um, so I would agree with staff due to the introduction of this bill that we should just wait uh, until we see what's, um, you know, what it is um, before we move forward with the uh, rulemaking. Any board member comments? Public comments. Uh, Tony Lum, Dental Hygiene Committee. We just uh, are in support of the recommendation. Thank you. Brianna, uh, Brianna Pittman with the California Dental Association, also in support of this move. We think this makes a lot of sense, look, seeing as how the legislature is looking at AB 1277 this year. Thank you. Okay, we're at 10 o'clock, and we're uh, next we're going to move into our committee reports. Uh, is the will of the board that we take a brief recess, allow you to check out of your hotel rooms, and maybe be back here at 1015? Please. Okay. So uh, we'll go into recess, and please be back here promptly as you can at 1015. So we can. 15 minutes. 15 minutes. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and uh, restart the meeting uh, beginning with uh, our committee reports. Number 15, Dr. Stewart, Substance Use Awareness Committee Report. Thank you, Bruce. <laughs> okay. So the meeting was called to order, Substance Use Awareness Committee was called to order. And uh, in Dece the December 1, 2016 Prescription Drug Abuse Committee uh, meeting minutes were approved. Uh, Senior Enforcement Officer Carlos Alvarez reported then on the uh, diversion program and, uh, and statistics. 
Carlos also uh, shared an update for implementation of SB 482 relative to Cure System 2.0. Carlos also shared uh, an update regarding Cures 2.0 registration and uh, usage st uh, statistics. And again, he shared uh, an update rega regarding the statewide prescription opioid misuse and overdose prevention work group meeting of April 26, 2017. Dr. Witcher shared uh, some background material uh, helping to uh, raise the awareness of the depth of the opioid crisis and outline uh, <coughs> two potential steps that the subcommittee felt would be positive first steps uh, moving forward in raising awareness of this crisis in the dental community. And uh, those, those two steps uh, will include working with staff, uh, recommending the board to adopt a policy statement uh, recognizing the epidemic of opi opioid abuse in this country and encouraging the dental community profession to actively participate in finding solutions to this challenge. Secondly, the recommendation would be, a second recommendation was working again with Dr. Witcher to um, work out uh, the questions and work out a survey uh, for the prescribing uh, practitioners to better understand their addiction management awareness of the licensees in California then based on that, the response to that survey, the committee will establish goals uh, and maybe better position to address those issues identified through that survey. And finally, we had a discussion of the value of establishing uh, resource links on the dental board's website, uh, which will occur once we have a coherent policy statement in place. And I take any questions from the board. Yes. Are there any programs where we can uh, provide some type of recycling of unused opioids, one? Two, is there any program through the drug companies that would help us facilitate or fund that program or a program of that sort? I think one of the, one of the resources that we're looking at are the local uh, mental health departments in each community. And the mental health departments will have programs such as that. I know we have one in Kern County, and they have drop boxes, lock boxes uh, for the drugs to be dropped off, typically at firehouses or you know, places like that. So we are working to identify some of those issues, and we'll uh, hopefully include those uh, in the information we put on our website. I think, um, uh, addendum to that, I, I did try to call a few pharmacies, and they're not able to receive um, drugs because of the liability of that. So I don't, it's, it's like recycling batteries. You know, where, where do we put it? And there, there are websites, that, but I mean, places like um, that sell batteries should have some type of recycling. So if we gave a resource to the dentist that prescribes and, and give them an alternative, I think that would be helpful. We'll receive ahead, Miss Burton, and then go to Steve. I just wanted to respond to that to say that there was just a, a big national day last week, and a lot of, at least in Sacramento County, um, our Justice Center, and there are some places that do recycling year round um, because they have the, the lockbox to do that. But for us to do it, um, it's very, very expensive. I think just the, the resource, I, d I don't expect us to actually physically do it, but at least have uh, something in maybe the website that says you can drop certain drugs there and uh, somehow incentivize, um, put some incentive to it um, that the patient that is not using the drugs will get maybe a coupon or something um, to to aware bring awareness to the to the patients that though I paid you know twenty thirty forty dollars for this drug that I needed but I really don't need it that they aren't stuck with it and they say well I paid for it I'm just going to keep it so a lot of times that's in their minds and a lot of times I have that issue with once I'm on the page, well, I'm not going to throw it away. Just using Sacramento as a, Sacramento County, larger Sacramento County as a, um, uh, as an example, that weekend that they did it, there were tons, I mean literally tons of, of 
of drugs left. And so I, I don't know that people need an incentive. They just need to know where they can do it. Sure. Thank you. Good comments. Dr. Chan. Alameda County had a program uh, that was, I don't know the details of it, but it was disposal of opioids and other drugs. And it was partially funded by the Alameda County Board of Supervisors. And I think it was subsidized by some of the bigger drug companies as a good citizen type of, of promo. promo. And um, again, I don't know enough about the, the project that was there, but there were security measures too because of dumpster diving type of thing and, and then reselling some of this. So I'd have to find more about what that meant, but it was by the county supervisors that supported this. And I think it was a grant from DEA, DEA I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah, there, there are a number of take back pro programs, they call it. Uh, the one in our area is run by County Drug and Alcohol Services. There's also instructions you can give to patients for safe disposal methods. Uh, so they can just get rid of them just by mixing them with coffee grounds or doing this and that. There's some recipes for that, so uh, just so they're not consumable. I did have one other question for you, and it's on item seven. Um, at the end where you requested an, um, an action item um, regarding a policy statement and considering a survey, my question is what would be the design, who would design, and what would be the cost? Well, the idea is to work with staff to answer all of those questions and certainly I think that in terms of de designing the questions I think we want our staff to do that in, de in terms of designing how to get that survey out uh, we'll we'll ask the department to help us on that Sarah do I have that right Correct. Uh, just for your information uh, there are existing survey instruments that I requested from some of the prior authors that did surveys and so we wouldn't have to start from scratch Further board questions? Seeing none, any questions or comments from the uh, public? Seeing none, that ends my report. Thank you. Moving ahead, uh, number 16, Anesthesia Committee. Dr. Morrow. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Witcher. Uh, the Anesthesia Committee met yesterday. A uh, roll call and a quorum was established. 100% of the committee members were in attendance. Uh, the first item was to approve the minutes from our February meeting, February 23, uh, in uh, San Diego. Those minutes were approved with, with appropriate uh, edits. The next item was the discussion and possible action regarding the courtesy reporting form uh, for deaths and hospitalizations of patients. This, this form was made necessary effective January 1 of 2017 as a result of Assembly Bill 2235. Uh, this uh, reporting form was reviewed. A number of suggestions were made to edits and changes on that form, and staff will continue to complete that form and get it posted as appropriate for use. Uh, the next agenda item was the general anesthesia and conscious sedation evaluation statistics. In the time frame between May of 2016 through March of 2017, 140 general anesthesia evaluations were conducted with, the, uh, with a pass rate of 100% uh, on those evaluations. April, May, and June, on the basis of already scheduled evaluations, there will be an additional 51 that will be evaluated. Hopefully they will have the same uh, pass rate as previously. That would make a total of 191 that would have passed the assessment for general anesthesia permit in that time frame. Uh, there was uh, seven permits that were canceled for noncompliance during that same time frame. There were 16 that were postponed because there was no evaluator available for that, which is an issue that we need to address. Uh, 
There were 33 that were postponed by request of the permit holder and there were 28 permits that were canceled by request of the permit holder. So that gives you some idea of the general anesthesia permits. That same time frame of, of May 16 through June of 17 for mod conscious sedation or what is now referring to as moderate sedation, there were 72 uh, pass and eight <coughs> failed events during that time period. Uh, there were nine canceled uh, because of non-compliance. Twelve, again, were canceled because of no evaluator present. Uh, Twenty-one were postponed by request, and 18 were canceled by request. For uh, medical general anesthesia, there were three that were passed during that time frame, and there were zero that were failed in that time frame. Uh, and as far as current evaluations per region is concerned, evaluators, I'm sorry, uh, for region Northern California, we currently have 138 evaluators for general anesthesia. We have 66 for conscious or moderate sedation, and we have nine for the medical uh, general anesthesia permit. In Southern California, we have 167, 91, and 10 in those same categories. This makes a total of 305 general anesthesia evaluators in the state, 157 conscious or moderate <coughs> sedation evaluators, and 19 medical uh, general anesthesia evaluators available for our use. Uh, the next item, item number five, I will say was a robust discussion uh, regarding three bills that are currently in the process of going through Sacramento. And our committee vice chair, uh, Fran Burton, managed that uh, and took lead in that discussion, and she's going to give that report for us. Okay, under section item five, we heard three bills, AB 224, SB 392, and SB 501. We did not take a position on um, any of the bills, but we, will send letters on each of them um, asking for some clarification specific to the bills. Um, there was a lot of public discussion um, on these items and um, we will follow up with the letters to the authors and um, seek some responses. Thank you, Fran. And the next item was a uh, discussion of the uh, SB 392. Oh, that was that was one that we did. I'm sorry. Excuse me. Got to go a little further ahead, don't I? Okay. Our item number six, agenda item six, was a presentation by the California Association of Nurse Anesthetists. Uh, this was a request for us in principle to support the concept of the nurse anesthetist being able to have a general anesthesia permit uh, for providing services in dentist offices for dental treatment or for dental treatment without the need of supervision for by a permit holder in general anesthesia. Uh, currently the code requires that authorizes uh, nurse anesthetists to provide those services if the dentist also has a general anesthesia permit. What the uh, <coughs> California Association of Nurse Anesthetists is wanting to pursue is to be able to provide their services without the supervision of a, of a dentist permit holder. Uh, and they're, uh, they're currently Apparently, the state of California allows uh, nurse anesthetists to provide those services without the oversight of a medical uh, director. So uh, this is a, a concept that they were wanting to present to us, and I would assume that in the future they will pursue uh, an author for some legislation to see if that change can be brought about. Okay. Uh, 
And uh, that sort of completes our report. Any questions or comments from members of the board? <coughs> Any comments or questions from members of the public in attendance? Mr. Chair, uh, Gary Cooper representing California Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgeons. Thank you for the opportunity. Uh, as uh, Chair Morrow just stated and uh, as Vice Chair Burton stated, yesterday's conversation was very robust and there was a lot of discussions from the stakeholders regarding the anesthesia recommendation that was provided in January of this year. One of the concerns that we as oral surgeons and I know some of the other stakeholders have was that in that specific report that came from the dental board after a wonderful job of researching the outcomes and the concerns that everyone had regarding the pediatric provision of pediatric anesthesia uh, that was based on 2235 and the letter that was sent by Senator Hill. There is a one line in your report that specifically asks the legislature take a look at how this affects care. Take a look at, the, at what the results will be before you do any legislation. There are two bills out there right now, our two bills, and the other one, 2224, has some language in there talking about a study. And my question to you folks is, if it's possible, you specifically ask that to be done before the legislature does anything. Although yesterday, there was a lot of discussion and hair pulling from the board, how are we going to implement all these complicated bills? How are we going to do this? What are the ramifications? Who's going to pay for it? Who's going to actually do the study? And so my question, my ask of you would be, if it's possible, if you could suggest to the legislature, to yourselves, to the different legislative members that are involved in this, to the stakeholders, how is that study going to be done? Who would you recommend do the study? That's the most important thing in this right now. There are bills out there that are floating around, and some of them are contradictory to each other, but there's one goal in mind, and that's to make it safer for pediatric anesthesia. And you've asked how this will affect access to care. Who's going to do that study? You specifically asked a study to be done prior to administering any, prior to putting together any legislation. Who's going to do that study? And my request to the, the dental board would be to determine who's going to do that study. That would be my ask. Thank you. Okay. Any other comments or questions? Okay. President Witcher, that ends our committee's report. Okay. Thank you. Uh, then uh, seeing no further discussion on that item, we'll move forward to item number 17, uh, alleged uh, regulatory committee report. <clears throat> The Ledge and, and uh, Regulatory Committee met and established a, a quorum, approved the meeting, m meeting, meeting minutes of September, of, I'm sorry, February 23rd, looked at the tentative legislative calendar and pointed out two specific deadlines, and then discussed three bills, AB 701, AB 1277, and SB, SB 27. Um, we did not do um, positions on any of these bills. Um, although SB, AB 1277 was one that generated a lot of conversation and um, discussion among the audience. Um, the next item, item five, was an update on preliminary regulatory packages, and um, we had an update on continuing education requirements and basic life support, defining discovery and filing, dental assisting comprehensive regulatory proposal, interim therapeutic restoration, elective facial cosmetic surgery permit application requirements, and the fee increase. Um, also institutional standards, the California Code of Regulations, licensure by credential, 
mobile and portable dental unit restoration requirements. No action was required on these items, um, although an update was given. Um, and then lastly was the discussion of proposed legislative proposals of which there were none. So that concludes my report. Okay, is there any board member discussion on this item? Public comment? Okay. Seeing none, uh, we're down to item number 18, public comment on items not on the agenda. Are there any of these? Seeing none, are there board, com board member comments for items not on the agenda? Okay. I guess this concludes the business of this meeting. Thank you everyone for coming. Have a safe trip home and we're adjourned until next meeting. Thank you. <laughs>